A wizard is, is never late. He arrives precisely when he means to. Yes. <laughs> Did I tell you I was telling Blair, um, like, he's like telling me about how busy his next few weeks are, and I was like, well, like, I can't do your thesis for you, but if you want me to, like, get you food or get you coffee, let me know. And then I quoted <laughs> um, <laughs> Sam from the Lord of the Rings being like, I can't carry it for you, Mr. Frodo, but I can, I can carry you. <laughs> and he was like, okay, bye. He was like, here's what you can do for me. No quoting Lord of the Rings. No, whenever I think of like the, uh, a fill in the blank is never late. A fill in, or a fill in the blank is never late. Everybody else is simply early. Like that always makes me think of the Princess Diaries too. Because growing up, I never, never did Princess Diaries. But we uh-huh. did have the DVD for the Princess Diaries too. Mm. Mm. Gotcha. I was thinking like, isn't that in Shrek or something? Also, I don't know. I, think it is in I don't know. But with, I mean, yes. I've come to the conclusion that DreamWorks movies are simply okay. just the better approach of other films. Yeah. Oh yes, they can actually see now. Great. Let me what? let me attempt to love kiss her. Who do you want to be in the background? Hey! Hi, Mimi. You might be able to take them off. You might not. All oh, this is being right. recorded, Why just so you know, too. Please. I'm just going to mute myself.
No. Nope. Hello again, everybody. <laughs> Bye, Megan. Three Musketeers. Yes, the Three Musketeers are back on the call. Um, I'm my hotspot is charging, so right now I'm just on flat internet, so it might be bad, but I'm gonna connect to good internet before we let the the masses in. Okay, um, sounds good. Allie wants to say hi. <laughs> hi. Hi. <laughs> I was like, who are the three musketeers? Can I say hi? <laughs> we, were on, we were on one Zoom earlier with this poet. So, <laughs> oh. Allie, are you going to volleyball? Yes. I already played sand for three hours and now I'm going to go play grass. <laughs> wow. Dedicated. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to go after this. I'll see you there. Perfect. Hi, Callie. <laughs> Callie's also going to hop. Callie! I'm going in a second, and if my battery dies, I'll hop on. Yeah. Oh, adorable. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go outside when I don't have to talk in case the internet's bad. After watching Claire out there this morning, I'm really nervous <laughs> to go out there. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to I have your bio, Claire. Oh, it's not very good. I'm so sorry. I literally, Zoe texted and was like, bio? And like, I was like, oh my God. I thought it was funny. I like the image of you staring at plants while doing a headstand. Yeah. <laughs> my sister is in the waiting room. That's cute. Aww. Cute. Where's Price? Oh, I think Claire is going to go first, right? Okay. Yeah. But okay. I'm stay here. Um, yeah, I'll do the intro and then introduce Claire, and then you're going to introduce Bryce. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, I was thinking of just. I'm going to admit Bryce. I just, yeah, I just pressed it. Do you have mini patches of those? Hi, Bryce. Hello. Where? Fuck. Um, when I was just thinking of like doing a nature fact, which is Bryce inspired. Um, and then just thanking folks and letting them know that the issue will be out soon, the summer issue, um, and that we'll see them next year <laughs> at Wild Mercy, hopefully in person. Yeah. Um, but if you have any other like closing things you want to add, you know, jump in there. That but. sounds great to me. Hey, cool. um, hey Zoe. Hi, everybody. Um, so we, we're having a little bit of a calving uh, crucial afternoon around here. Um, I'm wondering, it, Zoe and Claire, did you decide about who was going first or second? Yeah, so you're second, Bryce. I should have told you that in the email. Um, okay. So Maybe Claire's going to go first. Um, is there, Does that work okay? Is there any way to switch those things around? Because um, the, the lives of little baby animals may hang in the balance. Gosh. <laughs> yes, I, I think that's a worthwhile reason to. Okay. <laughs> that's fine. Is that okay, Claire? That's is totally that, fine. Will that be all right? Okay. Yeah. Um, Great. In that case, I'm going to go fill up a glass of water. I just came scurrying back in here from the field. So, oh, no. okay. Give me one minute here. Okay. <laughs> oh, hi, Susan. Well, oh, someone always sneaks in. Yeah, someone <laughs> always gets in, even though people are supposed to go to the waiting room. <laughs> Susan got in this time. <laughs> Either Susan or Claire Thompson. Yeah, it's Alice the Claire's. <laughs> <laughs> okay so i'll just we'll just yeah i'll introduce bryce and then we'll Great. go to claire which is yeah, how i'll, do, I'll do the do intro it. you introduce bryce and then we'll do claire sounds good right um yeah i'm thinking we should wait just a few more minutes um before we let the masses in <laughs> sounds good oh anna's there too yay yeah the link in the email you sent me so Bryce what, what do you mean baby animals lives are hanging like as in you need to be out there to take care of them as they enter the world or well, what I mean is so Jillian is out there right now we have a calf that was born and it's just not um figuring out how to suckle well and the first few hours are really crucial so Jillian's out there figuring that out and then just as we were out there working on that another calf was born um but they're just sort of oh stacking up at this point uh and Wow. So I think, th yeah, things, things are fine, but it would be better if I was gone for one hour rather than two. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but it's, all, I think all is well. I actually have a little window here in the basement so I can look out and see how things are going. So 
Wow, that's a big day. It it really is. Yeah. That's wild. Oh. Nice. There's a lot of people. Yeah. Thanks to Susan's email to remind everyone. This is probably yeah. a big part of it. <laughs> You can't get in yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Callie is next to me, zooming in, and I'm locking her in the waiting room. <laughs> Grace, did you, did you get my email about the hermit crabs? Was that you? I feel like we were talking about them, and you told me about them lining up. I did. Yeah, I told yeah. I told you about that. Um, I I'm sorry I didn't respond. I have been like all over no, no, you're good. today um but no it's 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 a thing at least as far as the hermit crab researcher that i talked to thought um so yeah it's it's a phenomenon did you did you look into it more yeah i'm gonna post a a link to a five minute video of it happening in the chat after i talk about it but it's like the video had my jaw totally dropped it was so cool um and they mentioned like a specific phrase for you know that lining up what it's called so i'm wondering if it's the same researcher group that you talked to but it cracked me up yeah i i um i'm so glad i wasn't just spouting nonsense no you were right <laughs> oh there's claire shocker claire you got in again from the living <laughs> room how do you do this <laughs> i even like accessed it a different way this time i clicked the link in the email instead of like typing it in so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Zoom just knows. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna start up my hotspot and connect here and then uh, I'll let the masses in. Sounds good. Wow, I have a friend who's a kayak guide in the San Juans who's zooming in. That's exciting. And my grandma. Wow. I love that you said your grandma loves Wild Mercy. <laughs> she texted me one week when she missed it and she was so distraught. She's like, I had it written down in my calendar. I can't believe I missed it. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I'm so bummed. She really loves it. Aww. It's cute. There she right. is. Okay, cool. I'm gonna admit everyone. Okay. okay. All right, I think we're gonna get started here. Um, Callie, do you maybe wanna move so there's not an echo? Sorry, Callie's zooming right next to me. <laughs> um, welcome to the final Wild Mercy, everyone. Thank you for being on Zoom while it's a beautiful day outside. Um, we're so glad you're here with us today. For those of you who might not be familiar with Wild Mercy, um, it's a reading series put on by Camus Magazine where students get to read alongside um, local writers. Um, obviously it's on Zoom this year due to the pandemic, but we hope those of you who are in Missoula have a chance to attend in person next year. Um, I guess though the silver lining is that folks from out of state can join us on Zoom. Uh, before we get started, just a couple etiquette things. If you're an audience member, make sure that your volume is off that you're muted 
helps that you don't disturb the readers. Also, if you are okay with having your screen on, we'd love that. It just gives it a little bit more of a community feel. Um, so on that note, I'm gonna hand it off to Zoe. Thanks, so great to see such a big group on our last Wild Mercy. We're really happy to have everyone here. Um, I'm gonna introduce Bryce, who's our first reader, and I have the privilege of being one of his students this semester, and he's such a great teacher, and we've had a lot of fun with activities like Curiosity of the Language and um, some really fun essay activities. So I'm, I'm really glad that he, you all get a chance to hear from him as well. Um, Bryce Andrews is the author of Down from the Mountain and Bad Luck Bit Way, both of which are great books. Uh, his books have been have received honors, including the Barnes and Noble Discover Great New Authors Award and the Banff Mountain Film and Book Festival's Grand Prize. He lives on a ranch near Arleigh, Montana. In addition to grazing cattle, growing hay and writing, he works for a nonprofit conservation group to reduce conflicts between large carnivores and human beings in the rural valleys of the North, Northern Rockies. Bryce's writing derives from his varied work. He's a fast fascinated by wild creatures and their struggles to thrive in the changing landscapes of the American West. And without further ado, Bryce, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thanks, Zoe. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to be back here um, because I was both, um, you know, I was a Canvas editor when I was at uh, EVST um, and I came back and read after my first book came out. And actually that, I was just thinking about it, um, And afterward, that was when we first started, you know, we sort of took up together. So in some ways I owe Camus a lot. Um, I'm sorry, Wild Mercy a lot. Um, I, uh, so I'm actually fairly nervous about what I'm going to read to everyone today because I've been working on this third book and it's about um, a fairly difficult subject. It's, it centers on, it's about guns and violence and inheritance in the American West. Um, and specifically it centers on this revolver that was passed down to um, so I'm going to read for about 30 35 minutes um, the chapter is called making rounds making rounds and um, what I would say by way of a disclaimer, which I always tell people not to give, um, I would simply say that uh, there are some difficult things in this chapter. I mean, uh, there are some, there are gun nuts. Um, there's one particularly awful individual. Um, so, you know, steal yourselves against him. Um, in the meantime, I'm just gonna start in here uh, and let me bring up my reading here. Uh, everybody can hear me all right. All good? Yeah, lots of thumbs up. Okay, here we go. Making rounds. Bass's gun rack is located in a strip mall in central Missoula. Its storefront advertised by a hand-drawn logo of a seven-point elk rack with a rifle hung across the brow tines. When I pulled up in front of it, the only other decor was a window mural, left over from the Christmas time rush and weathering towards permanence of a bull elk and an Elmer Fuddish hunter. The hunter faced away from his quarry, scanning the street with a cartoon rifle held ready. That he hadn't seen the elk seemed implausible, with the two of them crowded onto one pane, their asses nearly touching. But for those two figures in a paper printer sign, printer paper sign, reading, Senator John Tester supports anti-gun measures, the facade was dark and empty when I pulled up. It was early afternoon, but the place didn't seem open. I had come because I remembered Bass from when he worked at Sportsman's Surplus, a shop where I used to buy remaindered woolens, propane canisters, and other things related to camping, fishing, and hunting at a fraction of what they cost at chain stores. Bass ran the gun counter, or at least he was behind it, holding court every time I ever went in, and possessed an encyclopedic knowledge of all things related to firearms. He, or one of his deacons, sold me my shotgun and both of my hunting rifles. When sportsmen's folded in the late aughts, Bass went on his own. Having driven in 30 minutes from the farm, I resolved to try the door in spite of its unpromising aspect. Taking a canvas bag from the seat behind me, I walked over 
squinted through glass and found that I could make out several figures. One of them, as far as I could tell, was waving me in. The store was much smaller than expected. A single room, perhaps 30 feet square, with double tiered gun racks covering every wall. Lights must have been on, but the overall impression was one of dimness. Four people were in the shop that day, and they all paused to see me come in. Bass, who appeared to have done nothing but gray and weather a bit in the years since I had seen him, wore a camo shirt and oil streaked pants. He stood beside a glass topped counter upon which a revolver lay in pieces. A big guy named Donnie, who I also remembered from his sportsman's surplus days, sat behind the counter near the register. Two customers stopped browsing the racks, glanced sidelong in my direction and recommenced perusing. Morning, Bass said, what you need? Pulling the 357 from the bag and passing it to him, I said I wanted to learn whatever I could about a gun that had come to me from my grandfather. Bass turned the weapon one way and another and flipped the cylinder out to peer at a serial number stamped into the steel. Now, he said, eyes still on the revolver. This here's a nice gun, hell of a nice gun. He had a slow, nearly Southern way of talking that is common in certain rural circles hereabouts. Smith and Wesson, 586, ain't it? Dash one, looks like, Donnie said. 586-1, Bass confirmed. Nice, said Donnie. Hold its value, Bass went on. Built on the K-frame, wood grips, target sights. He pointed out the weapon's length and the heavy metal rod along the barrel's keel. It's a shooter's gun, he said. You can set this thing dead on any kind of ammo. Hell of a lot better, Donnie added, gesturing to the pieces on the counter than this right here. Bass grunted at that. Got that right. Goddamn Clinton gun. Though sensible to the danger in my question, I asked what it was he meant. Bill Clinton, see this here? Bass pointed to a tiny aperture in the frame between the trigger and the hammer. Takes a key. There's the feds for you. You can lock this so it won't shoot no matter what. Clinton's boys thought that up, the sons of bitches. You remember, he said to Donnie, we sold, we sold a shitload of these at Sportsman's. The boss bought them, jackass. Donnie nodded and there followed a short silence, which must have been my turn to speak. It passed. Bass looked me straight in the face for the first time since I'd handed across the gun. What do you want to do with this? He asked. I told him I was deciding whether or not to keep it and asked what the revolver was worth. Your grandfather gave it to you, he said, a note of disapproval edging his voice. I guess he'd want you to get the most out of it that you can. And if that means selling it, fine. But if that means keeping it, I'll tell you something. This gun here is always going to be worth what it's worth. I mean, it's not going to fall off any. It's going to be 550 this year and 550 10 years from now. It'd be more than that even if it didn't have this pitting on the barrel. That's the thing about, about a good gun. It ain't going to depreciate. This right here is money in the bank. He asked then if I wanted to leave the gun on consignment. I told him that I didn't for the moment and only wanted to know more about the revolver, how much it was worth and when it had been made and what it had been made for. What it's made for, he said, interrupting me, is protection. What it's made for is save your damn life. He handed back the gun, and slipping it into the canvas bag, I went out into the daylight. Driving home, I could not shake the feeling that the two men were standing there at the counter, running me down. Bass saying to Donnie, you believe that kid? Comes in here to sell his grandfather's revolver. And Donnie, shaking his head, guy gets in a bad enough spot, he'll sell anything. Several years before the trip to Bass's, I took the revolver to another gun counter in a small Montana town. Of all the places I've been where a person can buy firearms, I always liked that store best. It had a spacious, we got what you need feel, like an old time mercantile for hunters and fishermen. A tourist could walk through the front door dressed for Sunday brunch and leave equipped for a two week elk hunt in the mountains, cast iron skillet and all. Perhaps a quarter of the store was devoted to guns and ammunition and re related paraphernalia, and there I made my way. It's strange entering a shop armed. I never got used to it, and always expected an alarm to sound when I walked through the door. Of course, for gun shop employees, an unarmed customer is as normal as anything. She might be there to sell an old shotgun or get something bore sighted or have a trigger adjusted. He might have a question about ammunition, as I did that afternoon when I walked in nodded to the place's only other customer and handed my 357 to the guy working the counter. What load, I asked him, would work best in this gun for stopping a charging bear? In those days, I spent a great deal of time horseback and afoot on the high edge of a mountain ranch. It was autumn 
I had seen many grizzlies and the prospect of being attacked was real. The counterman considered my case. 357 is a little light for bear. You need to hit it good. He examined my revolver more closely, wrapped his fingers around the burled wood of the grips. Whole lot better than nothing though, beautiful gun. Walking to a rack of ammunition, he chose a box and brought it over. You need something heavy, solid. Opening the box, he passed a cartridge to me. This is the heaviest that thing will shoot. Heaviest I've got in the store anyhow. Solid lead, 200 grains. Bullshit, came a voice from somewhere behind me. That won't do nothing to a grizzly but make him mad. I looked across my shoulder. The other customer, a bulky, bearded, pink-faced guy with a rumpled look, came threading his way through freestanding racks of rifles. You need this one, here. He pointed to a huge silver semi-automatic pistol in the glass display case. Pull it out. The counterman obliged, hauling up the pistol like a big fish and setting it on the glass. Desert Eagle, the customer said, turning to me. 50 caliber, bud. You been to Alaska? Big damn bears up there and this is what they carry. Put a hole through a bear, I mean through, the size of a pie plate. One shot, bang, dead, pile his ass up. Picking up the gleaming pistol, he ejected the clip and ran the slide and handed the weapon grip first to me. He had the reek of a big man who didn't look after himself, a smell quite like a bear. Take a look, bud. That is a bear gun. For one thing, you can carry two clips and load it fast. That's a necessity. Absolute goddamn necessity. You think a grizzly's gonna wait? Will you put six bullets in that revolver? He looked at my 357, and I found, him, found myself hoping that he would not pick it up just as he reached out to do so, hefting it and sighting down the barrel, clicking the cylinder in and out with infuriating familiarity. What you got here, bud, he said while tapping the 357 with his free hand, ain't made for bears. This here, he said, is a can gun. I stood at the counter, Desert Eagle in hand. Tin can, I wondered as in target practice, as in for shooting at cans, a note in his voice suggested otherwise. He leaned forward, leering, rising slightly onto the balls of his feet with the expectant, eager aspect of someone waiting for the other shoe to drop. A joke, I thought. He made a joke and I didn't get it. There followed a silence through which the counterman wore a pleading, worried look. His was an uncomplicated face, round features, short beard, wire glasses, a graying widow's peak above the pale, untanned forehead. Long time behind that counter. He had grown old back there. Probably he had heard this all before. A can gun, the customer said, showing teeth in a way that made me shudder. Mexicans, Africans, Indian Americans. He clunked the butt of my revolver on the countertop to punctuate the list. What you got here, he said, is a can gun. Real pretty one too. Swiftly, he was gone. Turning, he walked past the rifle racks and boot displays out the shop's front door where his passage made a small bell ring. I stood there, mammoth pistol dangling at my side like a bandit who had forgotten what he was about. For a handful of moments, I tried bending the meaning of those words towards something other than the horrid truth. It did not work. He'd been quite clear. I knew exactly what he'd meant. The clerk wore his same worried expression, now fixed on me. He did not speak. I don't want this, I said, handing him the Desert Eagle and tucking my revolver into its canvas sack. Years on, driving home from Bass's gun rack, I got thinking about all that. I thought about it as I turned north from Missoula on Highway 93, climbed the Evero Hill and passed the sign proclaiming in Salish and English, the edge of the Flathead Indian Reservation, sovereign territory of the Confederated Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderay tribes. Can gun, that man had said. Indian Americans. Years had passed, but his words stuck around like dog shit in the lug sole of a boot. I remembered the dirty joke grin on his face as he delivered his punchline. It bothered me then, and still does now, that I hadn't managed a retort. It was the sort of moment from which a quick-witted or heroic person would have engineered a reckoning, but I said nothing. My thoughts moved slow as awaked sleepers. He said his awful piece and watched me just long enough to make sure the meaning had landed, and then he split. It chafed me to recall him hustling out the door, moving spryly for a man of his girth, secure in the knowledge that he had gotten away with it. 
driving on, coming nearer and nearer the farm I called home, I grew sure with every mile that I would not put that 357 up for sale while such men remained in the world to buy it. Visiting my parents on Whidbey Island in Washington, I stood on a beach looking out across Saratoga Passage toward Kameno Head. Offshore, the bottom dropped off out of Puget Sound, the seafloor plunging 500 feet in a tenth of a mile. That part of the sound is an underground canyon full of currents running one direction during ebb tide and another in flood, a place seldom and only briefly still. Once I spent a whole summer of mornings fishing in mid channel, mid channel. I'd wake up early and haul a plastic kayak downslope from my parents' place to the water's edge. Slipping free of the shore, I'd pull for open water, trailing line and wishing for salmon. I caught few fish, but didn't mind because I've inherited my father's fascination with the ocean. Big water is a magnet to him. It calls and he goes down to the shore. If he lived in a warmer place, I believe he'd swim every day. In Washington, it is enough for him to stand beside the ocean to hear gulls and see water in constant motion. All through that fishing summer, it was enough for me to paddle out before sunrise and troll for salmon. Though that stretch of the sound is busy, I almost never had company at dawn. It was quiet and I coasted across the meniscus over water so black and cold that I never felt comfortable staring into it for long. Sometimes animals showed themselves, bait fish jumping, Cormorants racing low across the water's surface, eagles hunting, a regular cohort of seals. Once a gray whale rose 20 paces from me entirely without warning, heaving past like a subway through a station where it will not stop. With a huge explosive breath and the rushing sound of water, it was gone. I stood on the shore, thinking that I might go out some early morning when the world was blue through quicksilver water with paddle splash and the bows hissing the only sounds, my grandfather's gun stowed in the bottom of the boat. At the, at the channel's center, where dipping a hand is like reaching into Hades, I'd stop and wait as the kayak yawed through a circle. Reaching out, I'd lower the revolver until the North Pacific closed cold around hand, cylinder, and barrel. There would be no noise when my fingers opened, just ripples and the sight of the gun tumbling away diminishing, vanishing with a fish belly flash. It would be gone and I would paddle home unburdened. That would be the end of it and a final one. I knew what salt does to metal. Anything unrinsed at day's end, a reels arbor or the steel grommets on a kayak's bow, blooms rust and falls to pieces. Years down the line, some fishermen would trawl deep for halibut, snag and haul up a carbuncled hunk of metal. If he could recognize the thing, he'd wonder why a gun was down there. Perhaps he'd invent a story. Of course, I didn't have the revolver with me then. It was only a thought. Later that summer, I climbed into the mission range, those egregiously vertical and grisly haunted peaks forming the farm's northern horizon, and picked my way among spires and scree toward a snowfield. Sorry, toward a snowfield. Not a glacier, though a few such persist in the missions, but a city block sized summer grade expanse of deep and hardened snow at the base of a north facing cliff. It was the kind of snow that never melted, growing only a bit smaller at the height of summer. It was steep. Crossing it, working my way obliquely toward the upper edge felt dangerous. To lose my feet meant sliding. A slide would not end well. I kicked steps into hardened corn, ascending toward the water streaked headwall, moving slowly, muscles burning. There, as expected, was the pit, where a deep snowfield meets stone, a void almost always forms. Rock warms with daylight, even if it faces north. This fact, and the melting action of water running down from higher places, and the downslope creep of so much ice and snow, creates a chasm. German mountaineers, having named every possible convergence of rock and snow, would call it Randcleft, a marginal crevasse. The French would say Remai. Anyone in whatever language would know the yawning void for a place of no return. What fell down there would stay in darkness to be worked on by the grinding, shifting weight of frozen water. Tugging my pack around, I took out my grandfather's gun. I studied the weapon carefully, fixing its details in my mind and then glancing again into the crevice. 
down to where the narrowing walls turned blue and then black. I could have dropped it then, opened my hand and let the revolver fall. Boulders would have ground it down and meltwater consumed its steel. It would have stayed under until the world warmed enough to make that snowfield fail. I could have done it except for the fact that it struck me just then that my grandfather would have loved the spot where I was standing. I was certain of it, knew it unmistakably in my heart. He would have gloried in the sight of ranked mountains stretching northward and felt the landscape's pure, gorgeous severity in his heart and bones. It was strange to be so sure because despite the fact that I stood in the snow with his surname and something of his build, his gun in my hand, I knew very little about Robert Thorne Andrews. I saw him regularly enough when I was a child. We ate holiday and other meals together. After my grandmother passed away, I pitied his being alone. But the truth is that my grandfather did not make a strong impression on me. He did not tell stories like my mother's father. He was not much of a character. He did not often laugh and joke, at least with his son or grandson. He loved Montana though. Everyone knew that. Most summers, whether he was living in Los Angeles or Seattle, he set out with his brother on road trips to Yellowstone and its surrounding valleys. He fished and sometimes hunted. He camped, initially in tents and then in a series of increasingly lavish trailers. Of the pictures I've seen, he looks happiest in the ones that were taken out here. In those photos, he's often dressed like a rancher in jeans, button-up shirts and a brimmed hat. In some of those old photos, he looks a lot like me. Gun in hand at the brink, I had the strangest feeling that he stood beside me, looking across rough, beautiful country, loving it no less than my father loves the sea. It was that kinship, I suppose, and my unmistakable sense of having conjured him that made the gun seem precious and my course less clear. To throw it away just then seemed a terrible waste. When it vanished into the dark, a part of my grandfather's memory or legacy would follow. Before I did what couldn't be undone, I decided I ought to know him better. That is what I meant to do when I came out of the mountains. <clears throat> Parents are not wholly departed while their sons and daughters draw breath. They cannot entirely vanish while so many of their alleles and memories and stories and objects are still kicking around the world. It was easy then for me to learn from my father that Robert Thorne Andrews had been born into a well-heeled family in Chicago and that he had been a sickly youth and that his parents had moved west to Los Angeles for their son's health and business opportunities. A middling student, he left college for the Second World War. He never spoke of the war to my father except once, then saying that he had traveled by commandeered train through ruined France, sleeping in ditches, waking one morning after making camp at midnight to find himself surrounded by the bloody rags and severed limbs of a field hospital. Of actual fighting, he was at the Battle of the Bulge and other of the European theater's infamous butcheries. He told my father just one short story. It happened in the last months of the war when the outcome was generally known and the allied armies were shoving the Nazis back toward Germany. My father was with the 137th Infantry by then fighting in an anti-tank company that spent a lot of time digging up landmines by hand. On evening patrol duty, he and a small squad of men were walking one side of a country road among fortifications, when through the gloaming on the road's far side came an equal party of Germans walking their own lines. The two groups could not have missed each other, but no shots were fired. They didn't wave or speak, but simply passed in the twilight all knowing the war was nearly through, none wanting to die so very late in it. I know that much about his war and that, about com that upon coming home, he quickly married my grandmother, Teddy. I know he kept a job which he disliked, working in the furniture department of the Sears and Roebuck catalog for a depressingly long time. I know that he was impulsive when it came to cars. He'd drive off one Saturday morning in a responsible sedan and come home in the least practical of tail finned Cadillacs. None of this, none of this at all, helped decide things with the gun. It only served to demonstrate that the past is a slippery slope. Running my grandfather's life back to its beginning, I realized that I had grabbed the tag end of a long thread. I had no clear reason for wanting to unwind it further. Perhaps it was simply the fact that the information was there. 
and it seemed natural that I should know about the people who came before. On my mother's side, we are only a few generations removed from Canadian obscurity. Beyond Alphonsine and Nazaire La Traverse, ancestry is an uncharted ocean to our bunch. My grandmother, Constance Madeleine Chartier Nehul, assures us that we are très français. At Christmas time, she cooks a meat stuffing with a name we cannot pronounce or spell, which my mother accompanies with an overabundance of good cheeses. We are all convinced of the fact that somehow we descend from the famously virginal Joan of Arc. This suffices as a family history. On dad's side though, the generations are more price precisely recorded and they stand within easier reach. His is one of those pedigreed American families with the paternal line particularly easy to follow. Starting with my grandfather, I traced it back through generations of surgeons, bankers, businessmen, soldiers, and settlers, until I ended up at my desk with William Bradford of Plymouth Plantation. Bradford served as the colony's governor for decades and was my 14th great-grandfather. Opening that book, I found his account of landing in the new world. And I quote, being thus past the vast ocean, they now had no friends to welcome them, nor inns to entertain or refresh their weather-beaten bodies, no houses or must let, much less towns to repair to, to, to seek for succor. It is recorded in scripture as a mercy to the apostle and his shipwrecked company that the barbarians showed them no small kindness in refreshing them. But these savage barbarians, when they met with them, as will after appear, were readier to fill their sides full of arrows than otherwise. And for the season, it was winter. And they that know the winters of that country know them to be sharp and violent and subject to fierce and cruel storms, dangerous to travel to known places, much more to search an unknown coast. And besides, what could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness full of beasts and wild men and what multitudes there may be of them they knew not. Here for you is a story. 100 hungry, hapless, undersupplied religious fanatics were dropped on the frigid New England shore. By spring, half were dead of disease. Starvation would have finished that work had the pilgrims not pillaged corn from a Nauset village nearby. From the start of reading that book, I was struck by the foolhardiness of the project and the resilience, if not foresight, of the people who undertook it. There were moments, moments, when I felt a flickering sort of pride. If nothing else, I thought, it seemed like my great, 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 Grandpa William had nerve and gumption. But there is another story, one so enormous and significant that Bradford's account of the colony starts feeling like a journal of a flea's life. The bug is active, sure, even plucky. It jumps, bites, and increases itself. It is a brave, interesting little parasite. But after a while, you can't help wondering about the huge, warm, shifting skin on which it dances and feeds. That other story, the bigger tale that my great, great, etc. grandfather tells without much meaning to, is about the havoc wreaked upon the North American continent by European cultures and microbes and weapons. That destruction is everywhere at the margins of the Pilgrim's world. It surrounded Plymouth Colony as entirely as did Bradford's hideous and desolate wilderness. His people, my people too, will steal land and water from every tribe they meet. They will shoot men and women and children who object to assault and larceny on a continental scale. They will kill fish and game with wanton abandon using ever more efficient tools until the woods and streams are barren. They will invent the 357, the Buffalo rifle and the 50 caliber Desert Eagle. Given time, they will do unthinkable damage, plowing the oceanic expanse of the Great Plains, cutting down nearly all the ancient forests, damming enough rivers to doom salmon runs that have existed since the world's dawning. They will make pits of entire mountains and dirty the sky. His descendants, my ancestors, will not only wreak this havoc, but learn to lionize the professional arts of ecological and cultural violence. They will love sodbusters, steel driving men, loggers, and cowboys. They will fetishize the tools of such work. This is particularly true of guns. Imagine the West, what appears, the sky, of course, 
a broad blue bowl, a heart magnet tugging, tugging upward on something in us all. Beneath it, mountains in tooth-like rows, entire ranges scattered on the plain, on the plain like abandoned toys. In the tawny mil middle distance, cattle. Nearer still, a tall, lean rider on some promontory from which much of the land's sweep can be seen. He wears a sweat-stained hat, blue jeans, old boots, the whole ensemble faded by years of unrelenting sun. Horse and rider stand motionless, statuesque, and there, shining on his hip, tucked into the weathered saddle scabbard are the guns. My grandfather's revolver, the one that passed from him to me is just such a six shooter, the very picture of a cowboy shooting iron. It is one of two weapons that people describe, people describe as guns that won the West. Guns that won the West. That loathsome customer, that can gun man, he knows those words by heart. He has dreams in which he rides as judge, executioner and savior through a savage land. In those fantasies, when a wild beast or a man confronts him, he quick draws from the holster and the gun in his hand looks precisely like the one my grandfather handed down to me. One shot, bang, dead. The rider presses on, and if part of him repents, he silences it. The thing was necessary, he tells his anemic conscience. There was no other way. I have ridden the horse, and I have carried my grandfather's revolver. I have been the tall, unflinching, Stetson-hatted white man in the panorama of American myths and dreams. I have shot a cow-killing wolf to death, and I have let another wolf escape despite its depredations. And both times, somehow, I felt traitorous. I know what winning the West means, and I want no part in it. From where I stand today, I can see how much damage has been done, and it is staggering. I can see back to the beginning, too, through the centuries to my 14th great-grandfather with Atlantic sand on his breeches, taking up a precious leaf of paper to write. Being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element. Their proper element, Bradford wrote. He was thankful, hardworking. He was pious according to his lights. But this is just as true. His gang came ashore with bullets. He was the spear tip, the plague flea, a first fusillade. Centuries on, having chewed through the meat of a whole continent, fattening the while, his descendants have reached the Pacific. There is nowhere else to go from here, no further west to find, and we restive sons and daughters of pilgrims are forced to a choice. Stare into the sunset, trying our damnedest not to think too hard, or turn around and face the road that brought us here. Years ago, when my grandfather's gun first came into my hands, I could feel history vibrating in it. The weapon was alive with affinities. It shone brightly with power. When I buckled the leather cartridge belt around my waist, it tied me to a line of men, men who were strong, men who endured and strove against a thing they called wilderness, straight shooting men who broke the world into shapes that pleased them. To carry that gun and be counted among such men was my inheritance as a settler's son. Coming home, pulling onto the farm, I stopped on the dirt road and looked across our pastures, pastures toward timbered mountains and a bluebird sky. I had a picture in my head of a six gun in a white man's hand, and I was determined that neither hand nor gun would henceforth be mine. I wanted out of the cowboy club and badly. I felt certain about that. Just as clearly, I understood that the past was not a stone that you leave by the roadside, something from which I might walk away scot-free. The thing that I meant to break with has been braided into me. It lived in objects I treasured. It was a violent inheritance strung through my heart and bones. In such cases, change is not a matter of wanting, but of work. The 357 lay on the passenger side floorboard, 
its outline visible through the canvas sack like a patient under bed sheets. Get working then, I told myself. Start with that gun. I saw a blacksmith's forge, a hammer raised, my grandfather's revolver red hot and smoking on an anvil. Why not try, I thought, as the truck idled, to make yourself a better tool. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bryce. Um, on that note, I am going to jump in to introduce Claire. Um, can everybody hear me? My internet is a little funky. Yeah, great. Claire is just two weeks shy of graduating from the University of Montana's Environmental Studies graduate program, where she has focused on environmental writing. Formerly the co-editor of Camus, she's very excited to be part of Wild Mercy's 2021 reading. When she's not languishing over writing essays, you can find her staring at her many house plants and trying to perfect a headstand. Uh, so on that note, I'm gonna hand it off to Claire. Yes, thank you. I am. Um, I brought one of my house plants next to me today to improve the overall background of <laughs> this uh, this reading. So, oh, and I'm also going to change it so I'm not staring at my face. Hang on, that will not do. Okay, um, now I can see you all again. Uh, yes. So yeah, I'm so happy to have heard um, a chapter of Bryce's book. It sounds like one I'm going to want to purchase and read once it's out. Um, that was, yeah, that was very cool. Um, so my, I have two pieces that I brought today. Um, one of them is actually a piece I wrote for Bryce's class. Um, a lot of us in the environmental studies program are in his visiting writer class. Um, it's the Bill Kittredge visiting writer um, environmental writing workshop that the environmental studies program offers every spring. Um, and one of the assignments that Bryce has us do is to do a curiosity of the language. So you find a word that interests you and just go down as many rabbit holes as you can with that word um, in a pretty short amount of space. I think I went over the word count <laughs> for this um, specific assignment, um, but I chose the word worry, which has some really interesting meanings to it. So thank you all for listening. <laughs> 2020, the year of worry. Worry for loved ones, worry for ourselves, worry for a planet already in a dire state. Anxiety has soared as a new crisis arises every day, each one in need of our attention, just like the last. Worry, concern, doubt, apprehension, uneasiness, fear. These are some of the synonyms for worry that the thesaurus gives its vocabulary bank overflowing with nouns that each sound worse than the one before. With so many causes for concern, it makes sense the amount of words used to describe that ache buried deep in the middle of one's chest, that foreboding sense of something gone awry that keeps the heart thumping. It's not a pleasant experience, this feeling, nor is the feeling of its original meaning, one founded all the way back in 1300, derived from the Middle English wearian that derives from the Old English wirgen, to strangle. In fact, the first definition under entry one of two in Merriam-Webster's dictionary says this still, worry as a transitive verb from dialectic British, choke, strangle, listed in all caps. The second definition is more specific, to harass by tearing, biting, or snapping, especially at the throat. Worried sick, worried to death. Translated through these first two definitions, one really could be killed by too much worrying. Not until you reach the fourth point under entry one does it touch on the word's more common definition, to afflict with mental distress or agitation, make anxious. Entry two of two, worry as a noun, gets even closer to its modern interpretation. Mental distress or agitation resulting from concern, usually for something impending or anticipated. Something impending or anticipated, 
i.e. everything that is yet to come, a treasure trove of reasons to be afraid. Sure, the pandemic seems to be coming to a close, but have you heard of all those variants? Great, a new president's in office. Same problems though. In an era where information can be accessed with just the swipe of a finger, it's no wonder there seems to be a generation of worry warts armed and ready with, have you heard the news? Worry wart, someone who is in a perpetual state of worry, usually unnecessarily. It didn't always mean this though. The first use of the word was, or the first use, the first use of the phrase was in the late 1920s in a comic book drawn by J.R. Williams, featuring a character called the worry wart. Instead of constantly being worried, the worry wart was a nuisance to others, causing them concern. It wasn't until after World War II, at the tail end of a time period known to historians as the Age of Anxiety, that worry wart took on its modern day meaning. In 1988, nearly 40 years after the Age of Anxiety supposedly ended, Bobby McFerrin released the first a cappella song to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, Don't Worry, Be Happy. The recording's cover image matches the optimistic message this title conjures. Don't worry, be happy, written in all caps in yellow font with two smiley faces on either end of the phrase. In the center of the cover, the torso of McFerrin is rendered in a circular frame, his white tux and yellow bow tie matching the merriment of his face, frozen in a cheerful smile, showing us all that there's nothing to be worried about. The song's music video, which features McFerrin, Robin Williams, and Bill Irwin, depicts the three of them stumbling through the things in life that get you down. The rent's late, the landlord might have to litigate, you got no girl, you got no cash, you got no style. It's simple, just don't worry about it. Be happy instead. At the video's beginning, you see McFerrin reading the newspaper and learning that the Dow, jo that the Dow Jones has dropped 508 points which causes him to go to his window and jump out of it. The stark contrast of this scene to the song's carefree lyrics speaks to a darker undertone of the overall message, which gets at a larger occurrence in American culture. Instead of facing or talking about our struggles, we would rather ignore them. In reaction to the song, comedian George Carlin alluded to this occurrence. It was exactly the kind of mindless philosophy that Americans would respond to. This song brings to mind another, more recent portrayal of the same message in popular culture. The, vi the viral internet meme featuring a cartoon dog sitting at a table in the center of a burning room with the text bubble, this is fine, floating above his fedora adorned head. Reproduced thousands of times, this meme has come to represent an entire generation's knee-jerk reaction to the deluge of tragic news that rolls in at all hours of the day. In a society so ill-equipped to deal with the toll this news can take on a person, advice like don't worry, be happy, is used in place of actually addressing the mental health crises so many are facing. Responses like this is fine and no worries and it's all good have become masks that are used to conceal some very real issues. Worry in its original form as something that strangles is perhaps fitting when looking at society's blase response to people in crisis to those worry warts. This worry can be suffocating in a culture that prides itself in remaining surface level. 2021, a year of less worry, hopefully, who can really tell? At least we're all in it together, this collective avoidance that keeps us at an arm's length from our problems. At least we have this stellar mathematical tip. In your life, expect some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry, be happy. Okay, so yes, so I actually really want to, I feel like another disclaimer is all of this writing is always being worked on this <laughs> like a constant evolution. So I would love to extend that essay. So any of you writers out there, I would love to hear, hear some feedback <laughs> if you want. Um, yes, so this next essay um, is actually, I am turning in 
turning it in as part of my portfolio project um, for the environmental studies program. Um, my theme that I've been kind of exploring is grassroots activism. Um, and with this particular essay, it looks at how attention and time play a big part in activism. Uh, and yeah, and basically, well, the title kind of speaks to this. Um, it's called Doing Nothing in the Pursuit of Something. Also, um, <laughs> my parents are both here. Mom, I'm sorry I don't talk about you in this, but <laughs> I do talk to my dad about my dad a bit, but that's not intentional. That's just what happened with this essay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> During late 2017, I spent four months studying abroad in Costa Rica, a country known for being one of the most environmentally sustainable places in the world. The country's most notable achievements are its carbon neutral energy sources and the federal regulations that protect nearly a quarter of their dense rainforests from de deforestation and development. With a propensity for peaceful negotiations, Costa Rica disb disbanded its military in 1948. The country is an admirable example of coexistence between people and nature. My host family's house was located on the sandbar of Punta Arenas, a thin stretch of land extended like a spindly index finger into the Pacific Ocean. Once a bumbling port city that exported coffee until the 1980s, Punta Arenas is now known as a jumping off point for tourists wanting to cross the water to explore the Nicoya Peninsula. The city is located north of the outlet of the Tarpoles River which flows down the western slopes of the Cordillera Central, a mountain range that splits the country down the center and releases into the Gulf of Nicoya. Even with its eco-friendly reputation, I spent much of my time in Punta Arenas tiptoeing around multicolored pieces of plastic that littered the city's beach and trying to, trying to befriend the hordes of stray cats that meowed all hours of the day outside my host family's house. The Tarquilis River makes its way through several metropolitan areas, collecting the candy wrappers and sports drink bottles that litter most cities as it winds its way toward the ocean. Once it reaches the coast, much of the trash is trapped in the cycling currents of the Gulf of Nicoya, where it eventually washes onto the shores of Punta Arenas. Nearly every day I could watch tractors comb the beach, shoveling the night's trash into piles for it to eventually be taken to a landfill. In October of that year, Costa Rica experienced one of its most damaging tropical storms ever recorded, the underwhelmingly named Hurricane Nate. Flooding rains caused landslides and torrents that claimed the lives of 14 people, as well as hundreds of acres of arable land and livestock. The day after the floods ended, the Punta Arenas news was filled with reports and pictures of a dead cow that had washed ashore reflecting the Gulf's tendency to function as a sort of boomerang for the rest of the country's refuse. This left Punta Arenas to clean up the mess. On the weekends between classes, I would hop onto a bus with my classmates and pay the 3,000 colones, approximately $5, ticket price to ride to one of the surrounding beach towns or national parks peppered across the country. Once there, we would spend the day wandering the verdant forests, stunned to silence each time we stumbled across a squawking scarlet macaw perched in the branches high above, or a Pinocchio-nosed Cotamundi shuffling through the undergrowth. The dazzling contrast between these tropical animals and the seemingly commonplace crows and squirrels I was used to seeing in the United States always left me wanting more wanting to explore more each Sunday, we reluctantly returned to Punta Arenas in class. In addition to the Spanish classes I was taking, on a whim, I decided to enroll in the conservation biology course. In this class, we studied the diverse biome regions across Costa Rica and went on field trips to see just how huge a difference a few thousand feet in elevation can make. On one particular trip, visiting a conservatory near San Ramon, we spent nearly two hours wandering a stand of trees just a few acres large, but with an astonishing amount of plant and animal life stuffed into it. 
this is one of the most ancient forms of life on the planet, said our professor Jorge, gesturing toward a fern in the process of unfurling its coiled neck from its spine. We stared in awe at this tiny plant, its ancient history so much longer than any of ours. Fossil records, records of ferns date back to the Devonian period, between 416 and 359 million years ago. Now, they are the second most diverse group of vascular plants in the world, with flowering plants taking first place. And they can be found all over Costa Rica. We continued walking, but soon stopped again once we reached a tree with a piece of caution tape tied to its branch. Jorge held up his hand, cautioning us. It's a snake. Do you see it? We squinted, trying to distinguish between the tree's mossy bark and the lump coiled between the trunk and the branch. Slowly, the difference between the foliage and the side stripe pit viper became apparent, as did our role in this ecosystem as bumbling humans, always just moments away from grabbing at the wrong place at the wrong time in a forest covered in vines and snakes. A few weeks after our visit to the conservatory, we watched the documentary Racing Extinction. Its focus is on the sixth mass extinction, one we're currently facing that is caused by anthropogenic carbon emissions. The film reaches its apex near the end of the documentary, when the filmmakers affix a projector to a Tesla in order to cast images of endangered and extinct species onto the exterior walls of famous structures around the world, like the Empire State Building and the Vatican. Despite, or perhaps because of, these absurdly dramatic Hollywood theatrics, the documentary tugged at something in me that hadn't been touched in years, not since I had learned in my sixth grade science class that birds would supposedly be the first kinds of animals to go thanks to increasing carbon emissions. Stricken, I'd rushed home and made a flyer that read, save the birds, stop global warming, in bubble letters with little cartoon birds fluttering around the border scanned 50 copies on my dad's printer, and then biked around my neighborhood illegally stuffing, stuffing mailboxes. Not since then, however, had I felt such urgency at the state of the world until I saw a manta ray great gliding down Wall Street. I need to drink some water. <laughs> I grew up in Northwestern Nevada, nestled in the foothills of the Sierras. My childhood was spent filling long hours after school reading, admiring my rocks purchased from the planetarium that came in that little black velvet bag, and writing short stories that are invariably still occupying different corners of my parents' houses. If I wasn't sprawled on the living room floor munching on apples and goldfish crackers, I was likely alongside my dad hiking through sagebrush dotted hills and pointing out the alluvial fans swooping out the sides of mountains. As a hydrologist, my dad liked to talk about water and he liked his daughter to know about it, which is why Nevada's hydrological history is so fascinating to me. Northwestern Nevada was once completely underwater as part of Lake Lahontan, a place to see lake that for the most part disappeared approximately 10,000 years ago. The water that remains from Lake Lahontan is found in Pyramid and Walker Lake two water bodies located north and southeast of Reno, respectively. Both exist in terminal basins. Pyramid Lake is fed by the Truckee River, which serves as the sole outlet for Lake Tahoe. The river runs 121 miles through the Great Basin, meandering its way between the Sierras before straightening to pass through Reno and Fernley, regaining its natural curve as it travels along the east side of the Paro Range and finally emptying into Pyramid Lake. Pyramid is Tahoe's elusive, lesser known cousin. My visits to each of these lakes were wildly different. Tahoe was a trip with friends in which we would take photos of each other and go cliff jumping, while Pyramid was a place my dad would take me to examine the otherworldly tufas, count the bathtub rings painted on the mountains surrounding the lake, or imagine what life must be like on Anaho Island. Anaho Island is a designated national wildlife refuge in the middle of Pyramid Lake and is likely one of the most unique locations in the world. 
established in 1913 by President Woodrow Wilson to provide sanctuary for nesting birds, it is prohibited from visits by the public and boats must stay outside a 1,000 foot range of the, around the island. The island is a volcanic formation that has a scattering of tufa deposits and is home to one of the two, one of the two largest American nesting colonies of the white pelican, along with a shockingly dense population of the Great Basin rattlesnake. Without human contact, besides the occasional researcher, Anaho Island has remained one of the last untouched ecosystems on Earth, untouched. The area is harsh and desolate with little vegetation to provide shelter from the scorching sun. Anaho Island's extreme conditions and isolation has protected it from becoming yet another tourist destination, unlike so much of the rest of the world. It is a human's nightmare and any other desert adapted life form's greatest friend. The times I spent learning and visiting places like this as a child contributed to my interest in the world around me, and it required parents invested enough to want to cultivate this interest. However, as I reached teenage dumb and college, my interest faded with distractions like my laptop and phone taking up my attention. Not until I traveled to Costa Rica was my attention harnessed again when I was finally able to see firsthand and understand how devastating the loss of the biodiversity of a place like this could be as a result of climate change. Unfortunately, to reach this epiphany, I had to board a carbon belching airplane to live in a country where my only useful role was as a carrier of the US dollar. Its weight felt even 3000 miles away. Everywhere I looked, I could see the present and future effects of pollution and globalization and overconsumption rearing their slimy heads in the crowds of white tourists, ignorant to the impact of their heavy travelers' footprints, mine among them. I've often wondered why my home wasn't encouragement enough, why it took flying across the world to realize that we're in serious trouble. If I, the little tree-hugging hippie who grew up burying food waste in the backyard and attending more folk festivals than sporting events as a teenager, had to be directly shown the direness of the climate crisis, how could this urgency be imbued in others without necessitating a trip to a tropical rainforest to see de deforestation firsthand? I moved to Missoula, Montana in August of 2019 after graduating from the University of Nevada, Reno and deciding that I was officially over living in my hometown. I was moving for an environmental studies graduate program. One I applied to during a stint in my life where I was obsessed with carrying reusable utensils and sorting through public trash cans, stressed after having seen so much plastic washed up onto Costa Rican beaches. As I drove into Missoula city limits for the first time, I passed the enormous 18 foot tall metallic high heel sitting in front of the Silver Slipper Lounge, a sports bar and casino. My mind flashed back to Reno's twinkling downtown, perpetually lit by the casinos on every street. Instantly, my anxiety about the move lessened. I'd handled Reno during its annual motorcycle festivals and weekly pub crawls. Certainly, I'd be able to handle this. Sure enough, I dealt with the move decently. I was able to fill many of my hours in the next two years with writing research papers, giving students feedback on essays, working on my department's environmental magazine, and interning with the Sierra Club. However, amidst all this busyness, I found that moving to a new place means spending a lot of time with yourself, which is how I realized something I hadn't fully appreciated before, the value of doing nothing. I first noticed that I craved nothingness in the walks I took to school, just over a mile long. The 20 minutes was enough time to study each house, nodding at a calico cat in a bay window and checking the tree on the corner of Sixth and Higgins for the pileated woodpecker that busied itself with hollowing the tree's trunk. This walk became a favorite ritual, one that soothed anxiety and helped form a deeper familiarity with this new town I called home. I knew when to check the flower shop's dumpster for cast off plant clippings and what hours to avoid walking because of the students that would stream out of the local high school, intimidating in their chunky platform shoes and thrifted knit sweaters, 
made cool only when a 16 year old wears them. These weren't facts that I could learn from a guidebook. They came about after spending time and paying attention to my locale. Just as I began to learn about the routines of my neighborhood, I also began to gain a familiarity with the land around me. Another favorite ritual I developed in my quest to do nothing was going to the wilderness areas near Missoula and finding a log, rock, or flat piece of ground to sit, quietly attending to my surroundings. Occasionally I would bring a book, but more often I would find myself sitting still, doing nothing, and letting my surroundings take center stage. Once, as I trekked through the woods looking for a good log, I stumbled across a handful of deer bedded in the dried leaves. Ears pricked, they, their wide eyes watched me carefully, ready to take flight if I dared do any funny business. Soon though, their ears relaxed and they continued their absent-minded chewing, not caring that I sat just a few meters away, soaking in as much of their world as possible before returning to life as a student. These tiny moments of doing nothing in nature helped me build a context from which to understand the place I was living. By spending time simply directing my attention to the goings on around me, I was able to care more deeply about the well being of Missoula. While I knew that climate change would significantly impact Montana in the coming years, experiencing firsthand the forests that would be lost to wildfires or the lands that would soon become snow free gave me more motivation to do something about it. This newfound motivation wouldn't have been possible without forcibly re-engaging myself in the outdoors, which required extracting myself from the computer and phone and walking out the front door. Only until I was able to remove myself from these daily distractions did I begin to feel a fuller sense of self and place. By forming these practices, a mindfulness for the environment began to develop. Even though I had always cared about nature, being given time to slow down and fully envelop myself in it was how I was able to care about things that I could not see or feel. Without the privilege of this time, I'm uncertain I would have developed such a fondness and connection toward Missoula, nor would I have felt as invested in its well being. By giving people the time to engage with their surroundings, it's possible to cultivate an empathy for the environment that comes not only when it is directly impacting them, but because they have spent time in the outdoors and can understand its worth. Unfortunately, our current capitalist system has made unscheduled time a luxury and accessible to so many people. This is especially the case for low-income people whose time is consumed by working and or stress related to working and the other responsibilities that come with making ends meet. It is no wonder that so many people feel disconnected from their surroundings. The United States is built on a labor force that is paid a pittance, creating a culture of overwork because there is literally no other option. Without support networks, both familial and societal, people are forced to fill their time with work in order to survive. This stress can lead to burnout, which has been found to cause all sorts of long-term health impacts from high blood pressure to stroke. Since people have so little time to go to the doctor to address these issues or give themselves the time to appropriately de-stress from the demands of work, these health impacts can be deadly. For the lucky few who are not as overworked or financially stressed, time is often filled by the demands of a digital economy that makes money off of our attention. The internet has noodled its way into so many parts of our lives that it has now become a radical act to resist its tantalizing tentacles. There are plenty of books, articles, and documentaries on the subject of the damaging qualities of social media. How logging onto apps that allow for anyone to like or comment on posts has contributed to anxiety and depression, especially in young adults. In addition to the negative health impacts, the corporations that own and advertise on these apps rely on our time spent online to make revenue, which is why they are designed to be addictive. The more time we spend, the more money they make. By regaining control of our attention, it's possible to spend more time in the environment using local ecosystems as a way to reframe our perceptions of the world and hopefully provide the impetus for people to care about the health of these ecosystems. 
Having time to do nothing can give us the creative potential to do something. Being bored, completely, totally bored, without the constant stimulation that screens provide, is a state that allows our brain to figure out how to entertain itself, whether that be through looking at... Hmm. Well, I'm missing a page. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Oh, it's on the back of this one. Whether... <laughs> Whether that be looking at birds, sketching landscapes, picking up the guitar, or simply staring into space, doing nothing but giving our brains the space to do something on their own without external digital stimulation. The positive impact free time can have is not only good for people's health, but also for cultivating empathy for the natural world. The, the importance of this time is apparent, however, attaining it is more complicated. Historically, grassroots organizing has been fundamental in urging employers to make changes to their employees' wages, lengths of shifts, and benefits received. Worker strikes are commonly the motivating factor for a corporation to make these changes, since without a labor force, their work can't be done. In 1965, farm workers came together to strike against the exploitative working conditions of table grape farms in Delano, California. Filipino and Mexican workers joined forces to, de to demand for better working conditions, incorporating efforts like community organizing, boycotts, and marches into the strike, which lasted five years. In 1970, table grape owners and farm workers eventually came to a collective bargaining agreement after a consumer boycott on non-union grapes slashed the demand for the grape corporation's product. The combined pressure of the workers' strike and the boycott along with the marches and organizing that spanned the country during this half decade, was enough to attain victory for the farm workers. Table grape growers had no choice but to sign union contracts that ensured their employees better pay, protection, and benefits. Without the united efforts of workers and organizations like the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee and the National Farm Workers Association, the Delano grape strike wouldn't have been nearly as successful. Individuals coming together with similar goals played an instrumental role in ensuring better working conditions for farm laborers and giving more value to the time they spent working. Examples like the Delano grape strike illustrate how essential insisting on equitable labor rights is in attaining people's right to their own time. My motivation to become involved in environmental advocacy was spurred by a trip to Costa Rica, made professional through my move to Missoula, but ultimately began in the time I spent unscheduled and free as a child in Reno, left to my own devices and given the space to let my mind figure out what it cared about. I became passionate about writing and nature because I had the privilege to spend my time interacting with these interests. The sources of our attention are what dictate the things we learn, love, and care about. By resisting the digital sphere that has captivated our attention and insisting on equitable labor conditions that pay people livable wages and allow for enough time away from work, it's possible that people can find what makes them tick and build a deeper connection to the ecological spaces around them. What we need is to allow people the capacity to pay attention. Audre Lorde once wrote that caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. It is not possible to care for oneself without having the time to do so, which makes fighting for this time a vital part of environmental and social movements. Unscheduled free time allows people the space to take care of themselves and direct their attention toward the things they love. This attention can provide the foundation from which activism can grow, encouraging people to, adv to advocate for and protect the people, places, animals, and ideas they so value. By recognizing the role of time and attention and activism, it becomes apparent that doing nothing, staring at trees, reading books, walking around the neighborhood, all seemingly unproductive activities in a capitalist society hellbent hell -bent on making money is actually the first step in doing something more meaningful. Through this lens, doing nothing can be a revolutionary act. And it is for this reason 
that I will continue walking around my neighborhood aimlessly, looking at squirrels, filling my afternoons with writing soliloquies about my love for houseplants. Each so-called unproductive moment spent is a moment gained in getting closer to the root of what it means to be a tentatively alive, to be fully and completely present, attuned to all that makes us human. Thank you. That was beautiful, Claire. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to both of our readers. And I wish I had a better segue into our nature fact, but I don't. <laughs> so we're gonna learn about hermit crabs. Um, and then we will thank all of you and close Wild Mercy until next year. But hermit crabs are wild. And one of the things that I learned recently, thanks to Bryce, is that when hermit crabs grow out of their shell, they have to wait around until they find another shell that's the right size. And so and by finding a shell can be very difficult because what are the chances you're gonna come across the right size shell? And so if a small hermit crab finds a big shell, instead of leaving and looking for a better suited one, it will just stay there and hunker down and wait for a bigger crab to come along and take up that shell. And then all these other hermit crabs will show up and they're all waiting for a big crab to come take the big shell so that the next size crab can take the big crab shell. And then they actually queue up from largest to smallest waiting in line for that big crab to come up and take over the shell so that the process of swapping can start. And it's called a vacancy chain and it's crazy. So I'll put a, um, there's a video that explains it that I'll put in the, chat and it's only five minutes long and it's amazing you'll never look at hermit crabs the same way um, and this actually came up because Bryce and I were talking about hermit crab essays um, which is a type of essay where you adopt a form um, so it's a really cool video I hope you enjoy it and um, to close out we just Winona and I want to thank everybody for spending part of your Friday afternoon here it's really beautiful out but we really appreciate the turnout and it's so good to see everyone's faces um, we also want to thank Bryce for being so inspiring to his students. We're really, really grateful to have you here. Um, and have a great summer. We're going to have our summer issue of Canvas coming out pretty soon. And the theme is Ramble, and it's going to be a good one. Lots of poetry. Um, so look out for that. And then until next year, uh, we'll see you when we see you. But we're so grateful for all the support. Um, Zoe, can I, so put one word, can I put one word in here, Zoe, quickly? Yeah, go for it, Dan. We have a, a lot of really wonderful thesis and portfolio defenses coming up in the next couple of weeks. And I know people are really busy, but this is the highlight of the semester. So if you all, they're all going to be available by Zoom. So if you can attend to them, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful, rich experience. So I just want to encourage you. I'm looking at you, Claire Carlson, and, and several others here on there. So I hope we'll see you at the, uh, at the defenses as well. Great. Thank you, Dan. All right, unless there's any final words, we'll say good afternoon to everyone. <laughs>